The following program is a Creative Magic Network production. You're listening to the Frederick Bai Show, where sky is the limit, and space is the place. Here's your host, Frederick Bai. Alrighty, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in, sit down, relax. Put your earbuds on. Put your earbuds on. You like that music? Yes, I know you do. Welcome to the Frederick Bias Show, and this radio podcast is about unleashing your creativity. Talk to experts who step into the known. It is a magical, inspirational, intuitive radio podcast as we chat with charismatic enigmas from around the globe. That's right, authors, musicians. Singers, radio hosts, business people, photographers, everything in between. I am Frederick By, the man of the hour, the man with the power to sweet to be sour, funky like a monkey. Hey, I sting like a bee. I produce sweet honey, and I am pretty. I am your favorite French Canucker. And today we we have a very special uh, guest today. Um, you know, all of you out there, you know this. You know this that. In order to live a creative life, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, you need to be in touch with your spirit, your spirituality. You need to get out of your materialistic, capricious being and just dive into, uh, go into a, a, a quiet place, you know, go into the woods, get centered. But today we have an expert and she's going to talk about She's going to talk about it. Her name is Linda J. Ferguson. She's the author of Staying Grounded, Grounded in Shifting Sands, Shifting Sand, I'm sorry, Awakening Soul Consciousness for the New Millennium. And her website is lindajferguson.com. Welcome to the show, Linda. Ah, it's good to be here. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. So your book is, uh, I mean, you, you touch on, on, on a lot of things. You touch on money. You touch on work relationships um and and you say we are in the aquarius i'm sorry aquarius era if i'm not mistaken got it right here <laughs> aquarian yeah aquarian era so that, that that's <laughs> that's interesting and i think that that's a fun way to put it um all right so so much information a lot of wisdom in that book but first let's talk about your your background a little bit sure So, so talk to us about about yourself, Linda. Yeah. Your <laughs> <laughs> right. So I've uh, I've walked uh, many many paths so far in this lifetime. I started out primarily in psychology, moved into the business world, um, moved into metaphysics, uh, mysticism, shamanism, kind of weaving this really interesting path of. How do we live in the world in this whole physical 3D body on doing this earth walk as well as connected with the spirit realm so that as we do this earth walk and whatever shows up in our life, we're able to keep having our feet firmly planted on the ground and having our hearts and minds open up to the spirit realm. Right. And, you know, let's go back to the beginning. Um, were you always spiritually inclined, you know, uh, growing up? No. How kid were you? No. <laughs> I grew up in a very scientific, atheist, rational household, and I was a hardcore atheist until about the age of 25. I thought anybody who believed in God was stupid, that God was a crutch, that you know, if you couldn't do it through your own talent and, and strength and, and sheer willpower – You know, there was no reason to come up with this other, in my mind, kind of fictitious being to help you out. And uh, it actually, I think one of the pivotal or a couple of the pivotal experiences in my 20s um, was I was in a pretty bad car accident, actually. I, I call it my Toyota pinball experience. Hmm. And I was driving out of Chicago. Lots of lots of traffic. If anybody's ever driven around Chicago. Going back to grad school in Indiana, I was in the eastbound four lanes highway going eastbound, four lanes of traffic going westbound. When I uh, saw that the cars, the, head, the cars in front of me were slowing down, I started slowing down. And for whatever reason, I just looked up at my rearview mirror and I saw this guy barreling down behind me. And I thought to myself, if this guy doesn't swerve, uh, I'm going to get hit. And sure enough, at the last minute, they clipped the left corner of my car flipped my car on its side, slid me two lanes of traffic over into a semi, hit this truck, 
Once I hit the truck, I bounced off, slid back over on the roof of my car, back across four lanes of traffic. And there was something in, you know, there's like that split second where where you're kind of moving and you're still thinking. And I thought, if I don't roll my car back over on its wheels, I'm going to smash into the median between these eight lanes of traffic. And at that minute, I it felt like something moved my car. And I my car rolled back over on its wheels, and I missed hitting the cement wall by about six inches. Hmm. So I walked away from that car accident without a scratch. My car was totaled. Everybody for, you know, eight lanes of traffic, everybody was stopped. That experience, that like in that moment, that sense that there was something else intervening on my behalf started to open the door for me, that maybe there was something else in this world beyond what you can see through, see, feel, hear, touch, et cetera, through your five senses. And that, that was definitely beginning for me to get on this more mystical path. You mentioned that uh, your parents were very, you know, scientific, you know, right brained, I guess, or left brain. Which one is it? Left brain? Yeah, left yeah, brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so rational. Okay, now you get into this car accident and then you go, hmm, maybe there's something higher there. Yes. You you seem to be getting in the spiritual, on the spiritual path, path from then, right? Correct. I started okay. studying. I started studying shamanism. I started studying, you know, some Sufism on the mystical path. Um, various, you know, the Kabbalah. I mean, I just was really exploring so many different paths over the next maybe ten years, trying to just sort of see what what else is going on in the world beyond the empirical path, which is that scientific, rational mm -hmm. path. And it was really through that ten year exploration that I started to see wow there there definitely is a lot more here and we can tap into it if we're open to it mm -hmm. now let me ask you this what was the reaction from your people from friends and family as they saw you oh yeah yeah no. <laughs> probably the hardest conversation i ever had to have with my mother was to tell her i believed in god quite really? frankly very difficult conversation she still to this day doesn't quite understand it really really and i mean so what you just accepted it just say, hey, I, it just what? became more and more real to me. It became the evidence. I mean, it was a bit of a scientific exploration. Like the evidence just became more and more compelling that I couldn't draw any other conclusion but to say there is something, call it a life force, call it a, a spirit of life, call it a transcendent uh, presence, something. Uh, that is bigger than who we are and what we know. And through the shamanic journeys that I've done and that I've both participated in and that I've led, I know, know that there are guides. There are absolutely guides that, that as we are open to working with them, they will work with us and show us what our next step needs to be. Mm -hmm. All right, once again, we're here with Linda J. Ferguson. She's the author of Staying Grounded in Shifting Sand, Awakening Soul Consciousness for the New Millennium. You can find her at lindajferguson.com. Okay, you talk about shamanic experiences. For those of for those listeners who are not familiar with it, what is a shamanic? <laughs> it sounds like a very <laughs> spiritually out there type of, you know. It could be, <laughs> sure. So some people may have done kind of hypnotherapy. It's I would kind of align it a it little makes bit me more. think of the it makes me it's make it makes me think of native american type of absolutely absolutely so i've done sweat lodges and medicine wheel ceremonies and those kinds of things and for me i definitely come to it from a little bit more of a native american um tradition mm -hmm. and basically the idea is i use my drum and you use the drum as a way through the vibrations of the drum through the rhythms of the drum the sounds to get into a, a, a much more deeper relaxed meditative kind of a state and then from there as i'm what i say i power up so i connect with several of my guides and as i'm doing the drumming as i'm leading the journey i simply allow to be shown what needs to happen in this journey. So typically there's journeys into three realms, the middle realm, the lower realm, and the upper realm. And in each realm, there are usually guides and assistance of, of things to see, things to experience, things to know, things to realize. And basically, even if you didn't 
even if people don't believe in there being guides in this non-physical, non-material realm, it allows you to access a deeper wisdom maybe within yourself that you might not have been able to connect with. So I offer it for people, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. Uh, it's, it doesn't matter. You're going to get, you're going to get to the same deeper level of, of openness, of understanding and of receiving. You know, it's funny. Uh, you talk about atheism and, and, you know, I, I had an interview this week, actually, uh, yeah, this week, if I'm not mistaken earlier, um, with a guy who is an atheist, an atheist. And, you know, we talked, we debated a little bit, you know, creativity versus, versus atheism for our atheists out there. And, you know, these guys, you know, atheists come up with a scientific side of things. And I get that. And I think it has its place, right? Mm -hmm. But there's the other side, you know, inspiration, creativity and all that. Like, and I was talking to him saying, you know, you know, when somebody has a near death, near death experience and they see the white light and everything to him, it's just a, a, a you know, a, a function of the brain, right? The mm. Neurons and stuff like that. What would you tell somebody? <laughs> <laughs> an atheist. He sure. says, you know, listens to this and is like, huh, you know. Right. Well, I guess a couple of things, of course, you, you might have heard the, the, book proof of heaven where there the doctor was having this pretty traumatic brain basically his brain shut down and he had this incredible journey and that there was no way his brain was actually engaged at that time and so i think there are there are enough descriptions of people who are in a state where their brain couldn't quote unquote operate right it's not a biochemical process there's no neurons firing there's nothing like the brain isn't isn't engaged and yet that they still can remember and see and experience something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of it, I think you can, I think we will get to a point where we will more understand, e even the hardcore scientists, that there's something beyond the biochemical, biomechanics of what we think of as the brain and as the body. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, I know the Dalai Lama is really doing a lot of work with scientists to talk about consciousness and that consciousness is something beyond what the brain functions as we can we can use the brain as a way to kind of map it but there's something it's like a meta experience it's beyond what we can think of as just what the brain is doing and when we can access this higher what i call the higher consciousness and we can access through meditation we could access through hypnotherapy or shamanic drumming or any there's lots of tools thankfully that we can get into this higher levels of consciousness that that really is beyond just, the, like I say, the biomechanics or the biochemistry of our physical body. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And and it seems to me that atheists, it's like a religion too, atheism. It's like, mm -hmm. no, no, there is nothing. Like, <laughs> yeah, totally people can be very closed. dogmatic. There's some dogmatic <laughs> atheists. Believe me, I know them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, to, to some extent, I will engage in conversation up to a point, and at some point, then you just have to say, "Well, I'm just we're just gonna have to agree to disagree." I, that's uh, exactly what I told him at the end of the debate. You know, we're gonna have to agree to disagree. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. let's talk about your book. Um, why did you write this book? How did this book come about? Uh, so, I actually, my first book um, called "Path for Greatness: Work as Spiritual Service." Uh, I, I think would be a book that would be of interest to your readers. It's really about how do we align our gifts, our passion, and our purpose to offer the work that we're here to do. And I mean work not just in our careers, but the, the bigger sense of our work um, to the world. And how do we do that from a place of service? So it was after that book that was written, and I, I did three national book tours, um, felt pretty complete. I thought, okay, you know, I've written the book that I, I needed to write. Uh, and then there was just this nudging, uh, and this was also at this time when I was doing a lot of the metaphysical study, and I, I just felt like there was more to be written, even though I had no intention whatsoever to write another book. I just started writing. I was kind of journaling, and then I was at my computer and writing down thoughts, and you know, lo and behold, it just felt like there was more to tell. There were more stories to tell. There were more ways to describe what what this world is. Again, this physical and non-physical world it just started evolving until you know two three years of this writing i thought all right i guess i'm gonna be writing another book yeah i mean it was very much a spirit-led process for me mm -hmm. 
Um, in your book, at the beginning of your book, you talk about the old paradigm of dualism. I think that's mm-hmm. in, I think that's a good that's a good point. You, you write the dualistic notions of spirit versus matter, divinity versus versus humanness are deeply embedded in Western culture, yet are not found in mi- in mystical writings and indigenous cultures, mm-hmm. mystical traditions, and indi- indigenous I'm sorry cultures <laughs> have integrated these two realms. And hold on to them despite the colonization of Western ideologies and lifestyles. Talk to us a little bit about that, the old paradigm of dualism. Sure. So, you know, given this kind of Western scientific empir- empir- empirical, empiricist mindset, if it wasn't measurable, it didn't exist. That's right. that's the bottom line from this empirical mindset, which is a very I call it kind of this Western scientific paradigm. So if it, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Now we know how, in some ways, ridiculous that is, right? Five hundred years ago, we couldn't measure bacteria, but that doesn't mean the bacteria didn't exist, right? We we couldn't a hundred years ago measure at the quantum level that we're measuring now, and yet we know that those quantum, um, you know, the sub atomic particles and whatnot are there, right? So so to think that if, if we can't measure it, it doesn't exist, that's just a false way of thinking. So once we once we open that door, and that was really kind of where I went to, it's like, all right, once we open the door that there's be- things here beyond what we can measure, then let's step through it. Let's say, well, what else might there be that we haven't yet been able to measure? And so once we can open that door, we can start to say, now there may be some teachings from other traditions that have always had that door open. I've been to India a couple times, and I, I just love that culture because it's so deeply embedded in this spiritual way of seeing the world so that when you go into those cultures, where, wherever those cultures are around the world, they're able to walk these two paths. They're able to say, yeah, we're here in a physical world, and we drive our cars, and we live in our homes, and we cook food and all those physical things, and yet there's always this meta to physical, this beyond the physical um, dimension to to life. They there's not there's not it's not either or. It's both and, and that's the paradigm shift. Right, right. We're all one. We're all one. And um, okay, what is a power? Why are you so you know power of gratitude? Talk to us a little bit about that because you know you, you say it's important to develop an attitude of gratitude mm-hmm. to kind of. Let love come in to our lives and, and get on this on the spiritual path. Talk to us yes. a little bit about that. Sure. So so I'm going to get to this place actually through this conversation we've been having for, about the scientific paradigm because as we look at the the essence of life, a lot of scientists are even coming to the fact that it's really this this essence is energy. Mm-hmm. If you look at it from a very you know physics scientific perspective, so. There's a, a phrase that then I think kind of bridges this gap between the scientific and the metaphysical that energy flows where attention goes. Mm-hmm. Energy flows where attention goes. People have people have said that in, in several different uh, ways. And so if we know that what we put our attention on, we give energy to, and if we give energy to something, it becomes more real, it becomes more um, prominent in our life – then we need to really start paying attention to what we're paying attention to, right? So if we're paying attention to all the crappy things in life, if we're always walking around going, oh, this sucks or or that political system's broken, <laughs> you know, we just had a recent election here in America. <laughs> um, you know, if we pay all of our attention well, to all the things that – Yeah, right, I'm sure you have. <laughs> if we just pay attention to all the things that are wrong, all the things that are broken, all the things that are messed up, we're giving energy quite literally to those things. If we give our energy to, if we pay attention to those things that work, those things that grow, those things that thrive, those things that support the life-sustaining essence of who we are and the life around us, we give energy to it. And that's the essence of gratitude. Gratitude is that, that activity, that process, that focus on all those things that are life-sustaining. Right, but you know gratitude, and I understand it, you know, and but geez, when when, when things, and I, I I'll, I'll take myself for an example. No, uh, you know, my life isn't perfect. Nobody's life is perfect, but you know, to give gratitude when when things just suck for a moment, yeah, 
sometimes you just give, give gratitude just to give gratitude. It's from your head, yeah. <laughs> it's not from your guts. That's from your heart. Yeah. Does this, does this have the same effect? Like, you know. Well, the more you can feel it, the stronger it's going to be for sure. And even sometimes we say it and we don't feel don't, it. Just, don't feel <laughs> it. Right. And sometimes you have to really work at it. So I always try to take a step back. So, I've also had times in my life where I've struggled, where I've struggled to pay my mortgage or I've, you know, lost a job or lost a, you know, I went through a divorce. I mean, there definitely have been times when I've been in some pretty dark, deep places. And yet I knew that the only way to get out of it was to appreciate what I had rather than focus on what I lost. And that's our challenge. That's on us. Yeah. Every single day to focus on what we have, not what we don't have. Focus on what is going well and right in our life and not are the things that are messed up. So uh, just a sort of a simple example. I, I was playing sports some years ago and I met, I slid into second base. I was playing softball and I messed up my knee and I was kind of hobbling along. Uh, I was on crutches and I what was coming up for me, it, for whatever reason, it's the mind-body connection. I was just really experiencing a lot of grief. And I knew it had nothing to do with my knee. I knew it was just sort of triggering up some of these old feelings. And I, I knew that the only way that I was going to heal both my physical knee and my, and my heart, because that's what was really breaking, was, was me looking at all of the things that were supporting my life. And that was, that was my journey to take, was to get myself to a place where I could say, here are the things that are working in my life. And slowly by doing that day by day, every single day when I'd wake up in the morning and every single day when I'd go to bed, instead of focusing on the things that I had lost or the things that weren't working, I had to choose to focus on the things that did. And sometimes I would lay in my bed and I would say, you know what? My toes work. I can put weight on one leg. I, my heart is beating. My, you know I mean? Like you literally, you can do a body scan. If nothing else, just yeah. go through your body and just look at all, wow, my cell, there's cells that are floating all through my body and my blood's pumping and my, you know, I can breathe. My lungs are expanding, right? Like every single, like just think of your body as this magnificent, um, I don't even want to use machine, this magnificent expression of life. Just go through that for 10 minutes and you're going to be in a different place mentally and probably hopefully then emotionally like, wow. I, I'm here. I'm breathing. You know, I mean, I, my car accident, you know, was certainly that wake up call. I don't want to have to go through too many more car accidents to just realize it's a gift that right. I can get up in the morning. All right. Once again, we're here with Linda J. Ferguson. She's the author of Staying Grounded in Shifting Sand, Awakening Soul Consciousness for a New Millennium. And you can find her at lindajferguson.com. And guys, right before continuing this conversation, if you have a passion, you know, something that fuels your curiosity. Well, on top of getting fascinating interviews such as this one straight to your inbox, when you subscribe to our free Creative Magic community, you will get super cool exclusive gifts in return, such as the ebook Happiness Quotes by the Ambassador of Happiness herself, Mara Sweeney, and also an exclusive conversation with two of my favorite people, Alex Okoroji and the blind blogger Max Ivy, one of our hosts here at the Creative Magic. As we talk about the influence of friends and college education on our lives, the competitiveness in a crowded field, the importance of business and financial education and arts and entrepreneurship, and more. And also, Alex has a special gift for you inside. I promise you will get inspired and entertained. Subscribe for free at frederickby.com. That's Frederick with a C. Buy like bye bye dot com. All right, let's talk about one of the one of my favorite subjects, uh, maybe because I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm dark or something, but embracing the shadow. Let's talk <laughs> about the shadow. <laughs> right. Um, all right. First of all, what is the shadow? And and let's start there. What is the shadow? So the shadow are are those qualities of of our own life that we don't want to see, acknowledge, admit, recognize. So for instance, it may be jealousy. It may be... Um, those judgments that we don't want to have about ourselves or about other people. And sometimes the shadow is even those things that maybe we're really good at that we just downplay that we don't want to like, Oh, I don't want to feel like I'm showing off. And so I can't let this talent or this gift come forward. Mm, and a the, lot of people, I think there yeah. are a lot. And, and what I find is what's so fascinating 
I don't know if I want to get too much into our American election, yeah, but sure, I, think, sure, sure. I was going to, I was going to ask I, you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a perfect example of the shadow people coming up and projecting the shadow of their own life onto our political system or onto people, group, different groups of people, et cetera. It's rather than admitting our own shortcomings or our own, uh, the things about ourselves that we don't like, we project them onto other people or we say, oh, this bad thing is happening here because of this. And so when we are really in touch with our shadow, it gives us an opportunity to say, you know what, here's what I do that's not X, Y, Z, right? So if I'm getting mad at somebody else because they're a crook, right, because they're swindling somebody, oh, well, there's – see, uh, anytime somebody starts pointing that finger at somebody else, as you've heard the expression, you point a finger at somebody else, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Yeah. I always want to say, well, isn't that interesting? What are ways in your life that you're swindling people or maybe cheating yourself? Right. And so it's that shadow experience that we're not willing to acknowledge those things that we do, those times when we are – less than honest, those times when we take advantage of other people, those times when we may bully other people, those times when we may be jealous, when we may um, take more than our share, right? All of those things that you hear people talking about, about the, quote unquote, those other people, that's the, that's the shadow coming out. Those are those qualities that people are not willing to own up to that they, that's going on in their life. And we, we got to clean up our own side of the street and say, you know what? I see when those times when I'm doing that and I'm going to work better at not doing it. And that's what that's the power of what the shadow is. It can come up in groups all the time. Anytime you got scapegoating going on, anytime you have people who are blaming and shaming other people, that shadow, that shadow yeah. stuff comes up and it, it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um you know, for the shadow, basically what I'm hearing it's our shame, it's our guilt, it's our just our dark side, basically. Right. Um and, and you know, it's understandable that we don't want people to see our dark side, but um what is what may be a what are the gifts coming from the shadow? I mean, how can it be a gift? Mm -hmm. Sure. So there may be times when you're super judgmental of other people, and there may be a situation where you have to tap into that and be able to say, "No, I'm going to call you out for what you're doing, so that we can move through it, so that we can put it out onto the table and deal with it." Mm -hmm. Right. That may be a time when your judgmentalness might be very valuable for a group. Um, or there may be times when if you are kind of a bully and you, you kind of um, manipulate other people, which we generally don't think of as being maybe the best thing, maybe there are times or situations where that situation warrants you to step up and say, you know what, I'm not going to stand for this anymore. And we do have to, again, address what's going on here. And it, maybe you don't want to manipulate people but at least you're going to call things out. So there are times when our shadow can be useful for us, but if we're claiming it as opposed to just having it um, surface without our real recognition of what we're doing. And so for me, it's about the conscious awareness we have. Can we claim and own that shadow and use it in a constructive way rather than just have it sort of come up to bite us in the face or bite other people in the face without our really using it and working with it intentionally? Because to me, it's all about are we using it consciously and intentionally or are we? Or is it just coming up because we don't have control over it or we're not even aware of it? Yeah. What about, you know, a lot of writers, you know, for all the, or, you know, artists in general, I mean, shadow can be a great gift for art where we can just express it because mm. I, it seems to me that the shadow, the more you suppress it, the mm. more it's, it, it's like, you know, it boils. Like the, the It's more energy it's, that builds up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, music to me, I, I Music is a, a great way to express the shadow. So as we as we have music that speaks to corruption or speaks to injustices or speaks to um, just some of the ways that we're not treating each other well or fairly, um, music is a very powerful way to, to bring to light those qualities that we may not want to be addressing. I just I find in an art physical you know physical art drawing sculpting whatever there's many ways that we can express what isn't being expressed um in either mainstream media or even just in our everyday conversations with one another. Right, right. 
Um, all right, so basically, what are some? I mean, we bothered a little bit, but do, so, do you have other tools to deal with the shadow? You know, uh, well. With- to me, it's about bring, bringing it into our conscious awareness. So yeah. we could do that through art, right? We can do it through music, through song, through dance. We can do it through meditation. We can do it through journaling or writing. Um, it's, it's, getting, it's getting in touch and it's being authentic. To me, it's about knowing that the things that we might have felt shame about, as we get authentic of who am I in my wholeness, there are these qualities that I have that I don't particularly like. And how can I bring those qualities to the surface in a way where I can take the shame away from it and just say, you know what, this is who I am. Maybe there are times when I'm not really proud of it, but it's it's the wholeness of who I am. And I'm claiming myself as a whole being. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not you know, this wonderful person that maybe I need to feel like I have to present myself as I I know that there are these times and places and moments when I'm less than the person that I want to be but it's doing it in a way that, that that's very authentic and real as opposed to trying to hide it sometimes I walk into a room um and I immediately you, you know it, it, it's like you don't like that person immediately like if there's something about that person that just I just don't like him or her mm. is, this, is this my is this our shadow is this, is this our, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, you don't even know you, the person, never even speak, <laughs> spoken to the person. I just, for some reason. <laughs> yeah, you may very well, there are empaths. There are people who are really good about picking up on other people's energy. And it may be that someone's carrying around some sort of dark energy. Maybe they, this person is just always really super negative. I find it really hard to be around super negative people. Um, and it, it may, and that may be because it's my shadow of the times when I can get really discouraged or really frustrated or really angry or upset about things. Um, and it may be that when I'm just around those people, it just sort of pulls me down and I just don't feel like I really want to be pulled down. So I think there, there are ways that you can kind of read or connect or touch or sense other people's energy. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, let's talk about like, – we, we start to talk about, talk about relationships. Now, you write a chapter six, spiritually aligned relationships, and you say there are three forms of love energy, basically, mm-hmm. just spiritual love energy, sexual and romantic love energy, and dramatic love energy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's an important point that you're making, uh, important chapter. Let's talk about – let's start with the first one. What is spiritual love energy? So if you've ever and, and, and let, let's I'm actually you know what spiritually aligned relationships what do you mean by that <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we we all of us are in our I I think of all of us as being on this journey and hopefully we are consciously evolving as human beings right we're dealing with our shadow where we're becoming more aware of our gifts we are. Um, aware of those times when we may manipulate other people to get our way, right? I talk in that mm-hmm. same chapter about learned rules for love, right? Mm-hmm. We know, we learn through particularly our childhood experiences, um, in order for me to get love from somebody, I need to do X, X, Y, and Z. I either need to submit or I need to dominate or I need to control or I need to shame other people or whatever. We play these games, right? So we've learned these rules for love. And as we can be more aware of how how we get love, what the things that we we do to try to get love from other people or even the things we do to express our love we're able to i, I think i hope uh evolve you know consciously evolve so that maybe that we don't play those same kind of games anymore so so in romantic relationships especially we that's when these games get played right that's when are these maybe non-conscious rules start start coming up for where we're working off these non-conscious rules that oh in order for you to love me i need to please you and so i'm going to just do everything i can to please you keep pleasing 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 and there may get a point where we realize you know what i just can't please you anymore because for whatever reason i don't have anything more to give or whatever i do isn't good enough for you and the relationship just isn't going to work and so part of it is getting in touch with what are those rules that we've all learned and we've all learned our own set of rules of what it takes to to give love and to receive love. Mm-hmm. So spiritually aligned relationships are those relationships where we start to understand what those rules are. And I, the example I give in the book, um, and I've seen it played out in different ones. So some people in their home life, they grow up um, thinking of themselves as the fixer or the caregiver, male or female, so that they're 
concept of in order for you to love me or in order for me to express my love, I have to fix you. I have to take care of you, right? So Mm -hmm. one person in the relationship may be the fixer, the caregiver, and another person in the relationship may feel like the only way I can get love is if people feel sorry for me, if I'm the victim. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got this perfectly aligned in, in one way. You have a fixer, a caregiver, and you have a victim, oh, poor pity me person, and they come into relationship with each other. Now, for a while, that relationship is probably going to work pretty well because one person is playing the victim and one person is playing the caregiver, the fixer. So so they may go working off of those rules for quite a long period of time, but here's what's going to happen. At some point, maybe one of the two of them is going to wake up and go, you know what? I don't have to be the fixer anymore, or I don't have to be the victim anymore. And if they start changing because that rule no longer applies to them, that relationship is going to, first of all, go through stress because because the rules that have guided and, and, and worked in that relationship aren't working anymore. Mm-hmm. And If one person changes and the other one doesn't, now maybe, hopefully, they can through whatever, therapy, group, you know, whatever works for them, they may start to realize, oh, I don't have to give and receive love in this way and I don't have to give and receive love this way. They can create new rules and they may be able to stay in relationship with each other. They can navigate through those rocky waters. My bet is most of them, it will be a challenge for them where they both can change and get to a place where it will work. There's likely going to be a, a stretch of time when one person changing, the other one isn't, and whether they can realign um, is is uh, you know part of the question for that relationship to survive or not. Right, right. All right. Once again, we're here with Linda J. Ferguson. She's the author of "Staying Grounded in Shifting Sand: Awakening Soul Consciousness for the New Millennium." You can find her at lindajferguson.com. And by the way. Right before continuing this conversation, the guys, we would like to thank those who pledge to our Patreon page. You you are really helpful to the show, and we are grateful for your help. In case you're wondering, Patreon is a simple way for you to contribute to the network every single month and get super cool exclusive rewards in return. Uh, I promise you will love the perks. Our Patreon page is at frederickby.com. That's frederick with a C, by like bye-bye.com, and click Patreon in the header. The money is used to cover our production costs and editing time to d- and also sharing to the different podcast channels. You can contribute for as low as $1. $1 a month. That's nothing. <laughs> all right. So thank you guys for your support. Um, all right. Uh, let's move on. Now you talk about, let's talk about the first type of energy. Um, Spiritual love energy. And you write in your book, attractions or crushes on people who are spiritu- spiritually charged are fairly common. You will you likely will feel good around them or even feel in love with them. Being present to love is, is confusing when you understand it only from a human perspective and not a soul level perspective. What is the difference? <laughs> so we've all gone through times when we felt a crush on somebody when we've just been attracted to them. And again, from this kind of human experience, from the human level way of understanding, it's like, oh, wow, I feel my, my heart's racing. I'm, I'm excited. I'm giddy. I'm in this, you know, high kind of a place when I'm around that person. Then we're likely to think, oh, well, then there's this attraction here and maybe I need to act on it, right? I pursue the other person or whatever the case may be. And it may be that the other person's in the same place and you go and you have a, you know, great relationship. What gets tricky though is if the, the, the sense of attraction, this sort of giddiness or this higher, this, oh, I feel good when I'm around the other person. It, it's not about necessarily this romantic connection, but it could be that, that the other, the person who's the object of your attraction is a person who's what I, you know, call sort of a, a spiritually awakened person. And they're, we've talked a little bit about energy, right? So their energy is, is at a kind of a higher level where they're in this place of gratitude or they're, they, they just appreciate life and they're, you know, they are able to move through the world maybe in a more joyful way, right? So they're a little bit more spiritually in tune, spiritually awakened. They, um, they just may, they may, um, ooze or, 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 um, give off these kind of waves of, you know, just joy and light and love. It's easy to be attracted. Who, like who, in my opinion, like who doesn't want to be around those kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, you can be attracted, but maybe sense that it's not that we have to have a romantic relationship, but I just really enjoy being with this person because this person's just, there's just something about them. There's this other energy. There's this, this lightness, there's this joy around them. And so it's starting to, 
understand that there can be these different ways that we can be attracted to people. It can be romantic or it can be just simply there's something about this person, this essence, this vibe that I feel good when I'm around this person. And I call that kind of this spiritual love or the spiritual attraction. Now, we've, we may have heard stories or read books about people having like the guru or the teacher, the spiritual teacher, ministers, pastors, those kinds of people. And it's easy to, again, if they're, you know, super in that God, God consciousness, that God awareness to feel it, an attraction to them. It doesn't have to be a romantic attraction, but, but you're drawn and you know, we might think of it as a charismatic, possibly a charismatic, you know, preacher or something like that, but we're drawn to those kinds of people. Um, I think, you know, part of the reason that people are so um, connected in 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 sort of charismatic leaders, church leaders, those kinds of people, is that there is this other energy about them that we are drawn to, um, that we can we can feel it some in some way that is different than what we might feel in a romantic relationship. Right, right. All right, let's move on with uh, money, 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 money. We love money. <laughs> okay, what's your meaning? What, what, what's your opinion on money? Uh, I mean, you talk about value, you talk about utility. What's you know, in your opinion, what, what is what is the meaning of money? So I, I like to think of money as simply a tool. It's a tool for us to use, or in some cases, misuse. Um, it allows us to move and operate in the world. I mean, we are in this three. 3D physical world and we could use barter. I mean, that was a very old system of, of exchange. Money is simply another tool of exchange. And it, the more, again, the more conscious we are about how we use money, uh, we can make certainly better decisions. And I'm not just talking about like investment decisions, but putting, truly putting the money in those objects, in those in the, for those groups, for like your radio show, those things that represent for us the things that we value. And when we think about economics, uh, I have a story in my book as well about talking to a businessman that most people think economics is about the spending of money, right? How does money circulate through our economy, for instance? But but the essence of economics, sort of the classic approach to economics, it's about utility. It's about exchanging of things that are valuable to us. And so I can exchange uh, money as one way of showing what's valuable to me, but there are other ways that I can exchange what's valuable to me. I can exchange physical gifts. I can exchange love with somebody that's valuable to me. And so when we think about money, rather than thinking about it, oh, I have to accumulate it. I have to just work hard and get you know, X salary or get X amount of money each month so I can pay my bills to step back and just say, what's valuable to me and what am I willing to do or not do for those things that are valuable to me? That starts having conversation about money on a, on a completely different level. Right, right. Uh, you talk about the prosperity consciousness versus the poverty consciousness. Yeah. And money is, you know, money has energy. What's the difference? Yeah, so you know we can. I've certainly. And, and how can we tap into the prosperity one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, gratitude is one of the best tools for that, right? Mm -hmm. We can be prosperous in so many ways. We can have we can have prosperity when it comes to friendships. We can have prosperity when it comes to creativity in our life. We can have prosperity when it comes to our health, right? So, so it's taking that concept of prosperity and expanding it way beyond money, way beyond any material financial gains that we have, but looking at our life in this very prosperous way, this abundant way. Uh, and that, you know, gratitude is, is one of the best ways to get us into that place. So as we look at all the prosperity in our life, we don't get so hung up on just the, you know, what's in our checking account. We can look at our life in a, in a, in a much broader lens. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the The first thing is to kind of break us out of thinking of like what's well, in my checkbook, you know, versus what I don't have is all the different ways that we're prosperous. The other thing that I, I want to share about kind of getting into this prosperity mindset is when we think about all of the ways in which we receive or when we block ourselves from receiving, that's a great tool in letting us learn about how to be prosperous. So if someone offers to buy you lunch, do you willingly accept it? 
Mm-hmm. You say, oh, I'm going to accept this gift because this is a gift, you know, from my friend or this is a gift from the universe. Or do we say, oh, no, 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 you don't have to pay my way, right? A simple thing like that. We, 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 we can get into these kind of automatic patterns and we don't even think about all the ways that we block prosperity or we block abundance or we block the flow. And so just in our day-to-day experiences, look at the times when you're open to receiving or when you block from receiving. Maybe it's even just a kind gesture. Somebody opens the door for you. Are you open to receiving or not? Mm -hmm. So if you want to get into this prosperity flow, get into the flow of receiving. And then the the other side of the coin is getting into the flow of giving, right? Mm -hmm. Do you give freely? And if you give freely, knowing that there will always be something that's going to be flowing into your life as you give, so you receive, you get into this flow of prosperity mm-hmm. rather than, ooh, if I give this now, I might not have enough. Well, that's that's poverty consciousness. Right, right. And so it's paying attention to those times when you understand I can give freely because I'm going to get freely versus, oh, I can't give because I won't be able to get. Mm, right. That's the big difference between prosperity consciousness or poverty consciousness. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, and, and, you know, in your book, you talk about a lot of the things, especially I would have liked to tap in to talk about the working environment. And you talk about energy and vampires and stuff like that. I think that's <laughs> those are important subjects because, man, they're there. And, you know, but uh, let's talk. Let's finish with Aquarian era mastery <laughs> in the Aquarian era. What is the Aquarian era, in your opinion? And uh, talk to us a trans- transformational empowerment. Sure. So, so in the West, it's so funny in America. I mean, our country is 200 some years old, but you have cultures, the Chinese culture, the Indian culture, various indigenous cultures, they're thousands of years old. Yeah. And so they think of time in a much more expansive way than we do in the West. And so when you think about there being these large chunks of time, like 2000 year eras, um, we, we, uh, some people have looked at the Mayan calendar that we've gone through sort of this transformation. We're in this kind of a new era um, where some of these old patterns, and I, you know, we talked earlier about kind of these old paradigms, these old patterns, these old ways of thinking that the, if the only way that I win is you losing that win lose mentality, that's a, that's an old paradigm that we can step out of in the Aquarian era is this new era where we're really understanding we can create win-wins. We can create prosperity consciousness for everybody. We can create these times and these opportunities where we're, we're in this thriving, life-sustaining way of living, not destruction, destroying. The only way I can gain is if you lose. It's a completely different way of looking at the world and looking at our own individual lives in those day-to-day experiences where we're saying yes to life or no to having things show up in our in our in our world so that's part of what this aquarian era is it's it's looking looking at our world in a different way and i think the 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 evolution of how science is and this what we talked a little bit earlier about our consciousness as we're understanding things in a different way, there's just a new way of, of being and living and thinking now than there was 30, 40 years ago. So right. that's part of what that Aquarian air is about. Mm-hmm. So the transformational empowerment process, just kind of real quickly, I, I map out uh, a process for us to tap into these ideas very concretely, uh, whether it's for our health, or whether it's for our relationships, whether it's for our, our work, our careers, for our family dynamics. So I'll just briefly, I'll just say that the three foundational blocks that if we can really get good at this, we'll be well on our way. So the first one we've talked about is gratitude. The second one is faith, right? How do we have faith that there there is this, this ongoing um, progression of, of life, this way to think about life unfolding and evolving in a more a conscious, positive way, and commitment. Are we really committed to living this way? Are we really committed every single day when we have the choice to say no to life or say yes to life? We're going to say yes. Mm -hmm. So faith, commitment, and gratitude are these foundation pieces for us living in this new way. And then from there, as we think about the changes we want to make, and that's why this I use these words intentionally, transformation, like the change, and empowerment. How do we feel the power to make these changes stick? Once we have this foundation of faith, commitment, and gratitude, we think of then the changes that we want to make in our life with our career, with our family, our health, whatever the change may be. We go through these then steps. Um, 
how do we first become aware of the times when we say no and we change those to the times we say yes? What, what, those awareness of uh, what we're doing that's blocking ourselves from receiving. Mm-hmm. How do we accept the life that we have right now in this moment, knowing that we can't change what brought us to this moment, but we can accept I'm right here right now and now here right now is the moment that I have the power to do something different. That's this empowerment piece. Um, then we move from that into releasing those old patterns, those old blocks, those old beliefs. How do we release those so that we no longer are tied to them anymore. So those old rules for love, right? When we say, oh, the only way I can get or receive love is to manipulate or to cheat or to intimidate, right? We got to release those old patterns that aren't serving us anymore in order for us to fully step into this new way of living. And then this last, the last stage is then this mastery stage of how do we get to where it becomes much more natural for us to be in this place of awareness, to be in this place of gratitude, to be in this place of continually clearing and releasing all of those old patterns so we can get better and better and better and quicker. And I can tell you, I've been doing this now for about 10 years. And what used to take me two or three days to move through when I'd get in these funks or I'd, I'd be pissed off about something, I can now within five minutes get to a better place. All those, I catch myself, I change, I release, and boom, I'm in a whole nother place. That's powerful, powerful energy to be right. able to move through it that quickly. Right, right. Wow. Well, that's uh, that's spiritually powerful. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's what it is. So the name of the book is "Staying Grounded in Shifting Sand: Awakening Soul Consciousness for the New Millennium" uh, from Linda J. Ferguson. And you can go to her website at lindajferguson.com. And uh, where can we buy your book, Linda? You can get it on Amazon. That's probably the best way. Uh, you can go to my website, and there's a couple links there on my website as well. I also have a, an, an online course, an e-course that's also mm-hmm. on my website um, that's got a set of recordings that I've done where I've talked through each of the different chapters, a set of exercises that you can do, affirmations, visualizations, meditations. So there's a lot there that you can do if you want to take this, these ideas further. You can do it as a self-paced course and uh, would want to invite people to go to my website for that as well. All right, guys, thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Linda, for this uh, amazing, amazing conversation. Um, Really enjoyed it. Deep conversation, guys. If you want to be creative, you need to be in touch with your spirit. Uh, Bye, guys. By the way, when you pick up her book from our website at frederickbuy.com, Amazon kicks back a few bucks to the show and helps cover production costs. No additional costs to you. No hidden fees. No nothing. No BS. So if you like what you hear, you can help by going over to frederickbuy.com click on her page in the blog and click the link to her book it is really that simple and guys when you are if you are an amazon shopper when you use our amazon links at frederickbuy.com amazon kicks back a few bucks to the show and it helps cover production costs again no no additional cost you no hidden fees no nothing just click the link the amazon link in the sidebar for all your online shopping at frederickbuy.com. It is really that simple and bookmark it to find it easier. Also, guys, we're looking for new hosts here at the Creative Magic Network. Um, if you are an individual who is, you know, an entrepreneur, uh, positively oriented, you have a strong message, you are passionate about what you, what, you know, you're a passionate individual and you're looking to, to maybe try your hand at podcasting, we can lead you by the hand. Yes, you can. Le- we can lead you by the hand. Just go to frederickbuy.com once again and click become a host in the header. And also, guys, the Creative Magic Store is open, alive, and well. It is designed with meaning, meant to inspire you, tap into your intuition, and add a little bit of magic into your life. frederickbuy.com, Creative Magic Store in the header. It's there. It's, do, go check it out. Go check it out. It's Christmas. It's coming up, baby. It's coming up. This podcast is free every time you download it on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever your you know your favorite platform. Please go over there, subscribe. It is listener supported. Tell a friend, leave a five star review. Really helps brother out. And with this, well, um, my wife is out, my baby is out, my stepmother is out. I'm by myself at the home, at the house. So I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna chill. <laughs> I'm gonna chill. Until then, stay safe and don't forget, live with purpose, passion, fire, and love.
Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Frederick Bai Show. For more information, go to frederickbai.com. That's Frederick with a C, buy like bye bye.com.